Hello and welcome to the Indian Writers Forum. Today we have with us S. Shankar. He is a novelist and critic, currently teaches at the University of Hawaii. His most recent novel is called Ghost in the Tamarind and he's here in India for a Fulbright exchange uh, program. Thank you very much, Mr. Shankar, for your time. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Shankar, you are here in India as a Fulbright scholar and uh, your working, I've been told, on uh, translations from the Tamil, especially uh, Periyar's works. So could you tell us a little bit about the project that you're doing right now? Right, so that's one component of my of, uh, of what I'm working on. Uh, my When I came to India, my idea was that I wanted to translate some criticism which has been written in Tamil into, into English because as I'm sure like many people are aware that uh, criticism, cultural criticism, literary criticism tends to be translated less than than fiction or poetry, so there is a sort of, I mean, I think translations don't happen very much anyway. I think there's a dearth of translations, period. But there's a dearth especially of translations of theoretical and critical mm -hmm. material. So I came with the idea of that, um, that I was going to explore translating, you know, one or two texts. And, and so that's, uh, so I spent some time um, trying to figure out what that would be. And, and, uh, and I feel like, uh, and so right now I'm engaged in translating two short booklets that uh, Periyar wrote on the Ramayana. Uh, one of them is, of course, very well known. Uh, it's called Characters in the Ramayana in, Eng in English. Um, and there, so the translation of that particular booklet does exist in, under the title Characters in the Ramayana. But the translation is not very good. I mean, it's not very idiomatic. It's not very grammatical. I mean, some pages are, are adequate and others are not. And given the importance of that booklet, mm -hmm. and I don't mean importance necessarily in terms of its ideas, some of which I don't agree with and some of which I do, you know, but importance in terms of its place in the history of, of ideas in Tamil Nadu and in India, I felt as if we needed a good translation. The second booklet, which is also on the Ramayana, because Periyar engaged with the Ramayana pretty much throughout his career right. as, a, as a polemicist and as a thinker, is, is called the English translation would be points about uh, points about the Ramayana, and that has never been translated into English. And in some ways, it's a more full engagement with the Ramayana because it goes beyond characters in the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. There is some repetition between the two booklets, so we'll see how you know what form it finally takes. Mm -hmm. It's all very much in in uh, process right now. But what I'm doing is really translating. Um, both of these, um, both of these booklets. So at the end of it, I want to see, maybe take excerpts from these different uh, uh, booklets and put them together in English so that people can access Peria's sort of thoughts about the Ramayana. So that's that's the project. In fact, it's it, it's 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 important because in India today we've we've seen certain amount of mo mobilization even by the Hindu right, for instance, in Delhi University, mm -hmm. in uh, on the Ramayana. So mm -hmm. how much do you think Peria? really is important in that particular sense as well as a contemporary thinker not just as a like these books as a which has a contemporary life and not just as something that that has uh, a certain amount of historical significance which it does yeah well i think it's very it's very important i mean in some ways i feel as if the environment around discussions of the ramayana are much more closed down now than they were 40 years ago <clears throat> around the time that uh, periyar died so i believe that you know i think it's very relevant um, and what makes, what makes you know, Peria really interesting, and I've sort of written about this in a critical mode, um, you know, even before the translation, I've already kind of, you know, written about it, is that what makes him interesting is that, of course, Peria was an atheist, Peria was a rationalist, um, and you see both aspects of these, of Peria's sort of intellectual personality in his take on the Ramayana, both f to his advantage and to his disadvantage, in the sense that, I mean, you see a very kind of a, iconoclastic kind of uh, approach to the Ramayana, but he also see him not being able to appreciate the power of the Ramayana, mm. you know, the power of the narrative, which, you know, whatever one might think about the political uses to which it's been put now, mm. it's an extraordinarily important and extraordinarily powerful set of stories, mm. which <clears throat> have, you know, been at the, you know, it's one of the stories which have been at the heart of sort of you know, uh, cultural life in this part of the world and, and other parts of Asia for millennia. Right. And that particular engagement is based on a certain kind of a narrative and aesthetic power that it has. And, and there are many things that we can and should critique about it or, or debate it 
and maybe sometimes affirm, you know, depending on what version of the Ramayana you're getting. Um, but I think it's, it's we, I don't think it's really debatable. The power of the story itself is not really debatable. So one of the interesting things about Periyar is that both, you know, his iconoclast, classic approach allows him to like really open up questions in very provocative ways. But I think he also misses aspects of the Ramayana right. in, in doing that. And both things are interesting to me. You know, both things are interesting Absolutely. to me. Uh, in fact, your question on uh, your, your 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 talk about the literary aspect will bring me to my next question, which is uh, there has been a certain sense of uh, of, of writers feeling uh, uh, suddenly that that they no they they no longer live in a in the free republic that they used to. I, I attended your talk in mm -hmm. Delhi University, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and where you and were you asked some really about. wonderful questions. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, thanks. And we also, uh, and we we also, and and you engaged with that question of free speech mm -hmm. quite uh, extensively. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, could you could you give a sense of what do you think? And you're a novelist yourself. Your novel has come out, and you're a translator. So you're engaged with it both in the sense of of, of as as a practicing uh, writer as well as a critic. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you place these recent developments in India? I think it's an ongoing battle. I think it's an ongoing battle uh, in India as elsewhere. I think it might be taking especially urgent forms in the last few years. Um, we are certainly af aware of the recent, you know, uh, slew of very violent attacks right. on journalists and writers, you know, leading to death even, you know, Gauri Lankesh, for example. And so, so it's taking very urgent forms. You know, it's taking very urgent forms now. I do think it's an ongoing debate that has any democratic society um, engages in. I can't say that it's, you know, it's, it's ever been fully absent. You know, I mean, this, these questions of free speech are always there. They're ebb and flow. And, and so part of, you know, the, you'll remember that this was part of my, my talk on Friday as well, is that uh, I'm not a legal scholar. I'm very much interested in the sort of the legal side of things, the rights, the laws, and all of that. And I'm interested in informing myself, even though I'm not a legal scholar, but I am a writer, and informing myself and engaging with those issues. But I think the specific work that I and people like me can do is in developing what I call cultures of reading, mm -hmm. you know, which both as a writer and as a critic. Mm -hmm. And that's a very slow, it's very hard work. It doesn't, right. you know, it's not like going to court and asking for an injunction or for some protection and you don't see an immediate result. So it's possible for us to uh, both never do that work mm -hmm and also to not appreciate the importance of doing it because you don't see the concrete results immediately. Right, exactly. But I mean things like going into the classroom, you know, raising these questions. I always have a unit pretty much in every class that I teach, mm -hmm. uh, which has to do with freedom of speech. I sometimes teach, you know, Hanif Qureshi's, you know, um, <clears throat> Harun and the Sea of Stories, you know, which I think is a great, for, especially for undergraduate students, it's a fantastic, you know, it's a young adult kind of a novel and, and it really, it raises these questions, you know, in a very liberal way. And so we can sort of critique the liberal, you know, approach to free speech, but we can also kind of complicate things. So I always try to include a unit and that's what I call about producing cultures of reading, you know, where we sort of, you know, try to inculcate in readers this particular idea of respect for discursive expression, you know? I think it's a very complex, you know, from my talk on Friday that I'm not an absolutist when it comes to free speech. I don't think it's really possible that, uh, you know, to, to maintain that free speech should be available without any restraint because, you know, it often is put to really bad uses. Um, I'm also very much, you know, of the opinion that free speech often is the is is the speech of the privileged and the powerful. You know, it's just a sort of a fig leaf, you know, like for you know, the the speech of powerful and privileged people is protected and gets the status of free speech, whereas like those without power don't have and have never had free speech. So I'm aware of those kinds of issues, and all of those I think need to be brought to the table in any discussion, but. Part of the work I think people like me can do is really um, is really kind of develop an appreciation and a very kind of a uh, expansive idea of the importance of cultures of reading. Right, and do you think that, in a way, uh, the arguments made against, say, uh, Ramanujan's uh, three hundred Ramayanas, mm -hmm. like let us take take those arguments, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
w one of the common themes in almost all of them would be that the sentiment of hurt. That right. my, my sentiments have been hurt, even with uh, say Padmavati. And right. th there's a history to this. Right. And the one connecting factor is the sentiment of hurt. Right. Do you think that this, this sentiment of the hurt, which is often used, mm -hmm. uh, comes from a lack of understanding reading? How do you read? That mm -hmm. Because it, it's your reading or your reading that will produce that sense of hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if, if you know how to read it, mm -hmm. or if you know five different ways of reading certain things, maybe you will not feel as hurt. Right. And sometimes some of these people will not even read it. You know, they'll not even see the film. They'll, they'll ban it before, even right. before it comes out. Right. And Padmavat is a great example where like some of the same groups which were you know, protesting against the film now said after the film came out that, oh, actually we like yeah. it. You know, it's fantastic. You know, this is like more power to you know, whatever regressive values we were fighting for because it's all there in the film. You know? So the absurdity of that position is immediately is immediately clear. I think there are I think there are very complex issues here, and I, I don't think we should engage in this discussion in a way which is not acknowledging of those complex issues. So one, of course, is the is the sort of epistemic, if I might use that word, um, difference between the different sides to the debate. So what I mean by that is that my particular epistemology of discourse might say that the novel is a specific kind of genre and so my sort of desire to create cultures of reading would be to help people understand that a novel is not the same as a factual journalistic right. report right now that is a particular kind of a position i can take because i have a particular idea of knowledge and knowledge formation and 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 genre and not everybody subscribes to my position Right. I mean, there may be people say, I don't care if it's a novel or not. You think a novel is different than a you know, fact-based journalistic report. I happen to think not. And my sem sentiments are hurt anyway, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we cannot assume that people are going to you know, buy into whatever framework we are putting forward. So the challenge, of course, is to generate frameworks mm -hmm. which can bridge that. Where I can say, you know, you don't have to agree with me. You don't agree with me that, you know, I, I would like to do that and I'm going to engage in this debate and I'm going to try and persuade you that a novel is different than a different kind of a report and please respect the specific, specificity of the genre. I'm not going to stop doing it. But in the meantime, you don't agree with me. Let us still have come to recognize some rules by which, you know, we can move forward and, and, and people don't have to get hurt. You know, people don't get, have to get assassinated. And so I think it's important to do both things. I don't know if I'm making sense. You know, it's important to do both things, both, you know, persuade people of what I would call secular progressive epistemologies and, and, and do that and bring it and then try to like, and that's part of the work. And that might be the, what I call cultures of reading. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are urgent situations right now and we can't wait until everybody's persuaded to, right. to defend certain things. That's why you have to kind of, um, you know, make Take use of legal way, legal or, way or, or, or other, you know, avenues. And also, you know, and this is, has to do with the, try to identify other values which can be fairly, you know, universal in scope, right. you know, which don't take us to these questions of like, well, I don't care about a novel. I've never read a novel in right. my life. You know, you might think the novel is like a wonderful artistic artifact, you know, cultural form and that we should, but I don't, you know, for me, you know, any representation of a particular kind of you know, sacred mm -hmm. is, is, is problematic, mm -hmm. you know. And it's not just, of course, a Hindu problem. It's a problem in any religious tradition, in one might say. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, I, I, I wanted you to say a little bit about uh, your positioning in the States now. Uh, and uh, this, so how, how do you see some of these, uh, some of these questions of uh, free speech, etc., played out in the States? Because they'll here it's it's like we are defending free speech right. and in the states as you had also mentioned uh, in your talk that it's it's the reverse that you use free speech to basically promote hate speech or Absolutely. promote yeah. promote speech which which is actually quite uh, objectively hurting somebody right. or, or aims to hurt somebody right. right absolutely yeah so that's very much a phenomenon which is going on and 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 free speech here is a sort of a very loose term under which a whole different of you know a whole different set of issues can can be grouped and and in the final analysis i think free speech may not even be the best term here because you know of the history you know of the legal and other kind of history of that term 
because academic freedom, you know, uh, freedom for certain kinds of discursive practices can, you know, are also, and, and free speech already pre, you know, disposes you to looking at it in a particular way. So we should be open to the idea that, that you know, free speech can be a, as obscuring as it's clarifying. So what we're interested, of course, in the ability to like, to express and, and exchange ideas and engage in sort of the, 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 you know, the debate over ideas in linguistic and other forms. You know, I'm putting it in really convoluted way, partly to try and uh, have us think about ways in which we want to get beyond the kind of obscuring aspects of, right. of free speech. So um, in the US, of course, and free speech has been used explicitly and kind of invocations of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution has been used by, by right-wing elements of different stripes to, <clears throat> to claim that they have the right to come to college because the battle is very much over college campuses and to go to college campuses and under the, under the claim of a kind of a, the right to free speech to, to have the, you know, the right to spout, you know, right. to, to spout hate. Now that of course is, a, is even, even though that may not quite happen in India the same way, and sometimes it does, but maybe not in the same sort of orchestrated phenomenon that's, that's going on uh, in the US, is occasion for us to think about the ways in which free speech can be used to expand, uh, which is why my position is that, is that you cannot have an absolutist right, right. to free speech. Mm -hmm. And, and the challenge is to, is to how to make those two different sides of the free speech issue square. And if you remember, you know, uh, uh, in my talk on Friday, I'm interested in exploring both recognizing the distinction, but also exploring ways for us to think beyond what, might, what we, one might call a formalistic understanding of free speech mm -hmm. and a content, a substantive understanding of free speech. Mm -hmm. By which I mean is that the absolutist idea of free speech understands free speech in a formalistic way. Okay. It basically says free speech. Right, the content of the free speech doesn't matter. You know, it's it's it's. I have a formal right to free speech, and I'm using formal in my kind of a literary critical way. You know, I have a, you know, and and you don't have the right to like challenge it because I have that formalistic. And this is what I call a formalistic. You know, right. uh, the advantage of having a formalistic idea of free speech is that it gives you a secure basis on which to stand because it's not contextual. Right, you're not revising it under every new context. The danger of it is that all kinds of stuff comes in, right. you know, sexist, misogynist, white supremacist, you know, uh, you know. In here, Muslim hating me. Muslim hating, you know, Hindu fundamentalist of the worst kind, you know, casteist. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things come in and they all have to be given free play because you have a formalistic idea, idea of free speech. So I think we need to find approaches where we are both able to, you know, we're able to have a position, have a debate about these issues, and also have a position on these issues, which recognizes that distinction between a kind of formalistic defense of free speech and a kind of substantive, recognize the substantive content of free speech, and is able to put it together. So I think, you know, maybe, you know, something, what if we were to ask ourselves that, you know, a value like, Ambedkar's idea of ahimsa, you know, uh, you know that there are certain things, you know, and this is a very long. I don't want to get sidetracked on this, but the basic idea would be that there is a long tradition of thinking about violence and response to violence within Indian traditions and also in other parts of the world, for which ahimsa can be a kind of a e useful kind of placeholder. What if we were to use ahimsa and the tradition of thinking about ahimsa to look at the free speech issue, you know, and, and recognize that violence or ahimsa is done both by claiming a formalistic right to free speech and also in, through a kind of substantive expression of free speech. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And so that would be a way to try and kind of shift the discussion, you know. Okay. My final question is a slightly personal question for you. Uh, Somebody who's lived in the States for how many decades now? Um, more than three. More than yeah. three. Okay. But uh, at the same time, who's engaged in Tamil literary cultures uh -huh. and who's engaged in teaching uh, students there right. and, and sometimes here as well, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
elements of, say, uh, your book on, vernac on, on vernaculars and translation, mm -hmm. for instance. So how do you place yourself, and you're a novelist yourself, mm -hmm. so how do you place these, these very different, do you see them as different, different strides to one particular aim, which is to sort of have a world where a certain kind of free exchange happens, where people in the West can understand us and we can understand people in the West? Or um, you know, I love that, uh, you know, it was Aimé Césaire who, and I might be getting the quotation, I may not get it exactly right, but he said, you know, the great um, uh, Caribbean Francophone intellectual Aimé Césaire said, um, you know, translation is the oxygen of civilization, you know, and there is something very important about that, you know, it's the way in which civilizations, you know, um, share and and ideas and debate ideas and disagree with each other you know so you know translation as the oxygen of of civilization um, I do subscribe to that view you know and so the, my work on translation has very much been around that um, I you know, there, are, there is a tradition, a re fairly recent tradition, which I think is beginning to shift again now, of thinking of translation under colonial circumstances as mainly a kind of a violent, you know, as a kind of a, a, a way in which violence was done to the colonized. Uh, you know, the, the most obvious example would be the renaming of places, right? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, a native, you know, American name is replaced by New York or Boston, you know, mm -hmm. so that would be a kind of a translation which is very violent. I think we need to recognize that. I think we need to recognize the immense potential for violence within translation, um, but also recognize that translation can be the oxygen of civilization. And so I think the work which I'm doing um, in multiple ways, and this, I don't, I don't know if I would say that this is a kind of a, a deliberate kind of campaign on my part. It's more a result of my existential circumstance. You know, so I, you know, I'm very engaged in India, grew up in India, remain very engaged, uh, but also I have lived in the US for three decades, keep going back and forth, you know, work with Tamil, but also write mostly in English. And I think it's just that, it's just the confluence of all those different very personal elements have led me to think about and do the kind of work which I'm doing, which I hope, you know, I hate to say that it's a deliberate, um, campaign because there's something really, I think, uh, to my mind anyway, problematic about, you know, you know, you, you know, global dialogue, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I, just, I just don't like to think in those terms because I think, you know, uh, it commits us the conversation between civilizations. I think that model is very kind of. It's also as if it, it claims that it's happening now. It's right? happening now right. and it's. It's it, always happened actually. Yeah, it's always happened. Also, it's very facile, you know, and as if it's very, it seems very superficial, you know, we're all just, you know, good people and we sit down and talk about things and things will, things will, you know, sort get clear, get so. sorted out. Yeah. And my experience is, I think, you know, we need to have a more robust more compassionate to go to again Ambedkar and the, and the Buddha and his Dharma, uh, you know, a more ethically kind of, you know, uh, sensitive kind of approach to to these up questions, but also recognize the immense complications of it that a liber liberal notion of conversation is not necessarily going to do. So I, so that's the part of which I'm resisting, mm -hmm. but, but really this idea of you know, a kind of a global engagement over ideas is very, is very much what I think I'm part of, yeah. Right, and I'm glad that you're a part of, of uh, that we as Indian Writers Forum are a part of your conversation now. Thanks very much for your Thank time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching. Make sure that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube for more such engaged discussions. Thanks.